Eu gostaria de, de agradecer a professora Lucinda, a professora Margarida, também o professor Mário, de me ter convidado de, de, de dar essa primeira lição de Finistera Lecture. É um grande honra para mim. Lamento que eu não, não tenho preparado a minha intervenção em português. E o meu português não é uh, suficientemente... De, um, eu não domino a língua portuguesa suficientemente bem para fazer uma intervenção sem preparação. Então, uh, mas eu agradeço a todos vocês de... Uh, de estar aqui, eu espero que depois da, da palestra que nós podemos debater, seja em português, em inglês ou como vocês quiserem, uma mistura de idiomas, uh? muito globalizado. Então, eu vou uh, continuar em in, in inglês. So, switch. Um, I want to speak today about, um, to try and link uh, the field of economic geography to uh, some very contemporary issues and to speak about, uh, I would say, the, the moment that we find ourselves in, <clears throat> in the world, and a link between, as it says in the title, globalization, nationalism, and uh, the field of economic uh, geography. And this is something of a, of a, of a provocation to begin with, uh, which I lifted from um, <clears throat> the main, uh, let's say, authority on a liberal globalist view of the world, which is, uh, you see this quote, led by London, big cities are sucking up talent, jobs and investment from everywhere else. That's, that's a statement, that's easy. And then they go, good. Okay, so. That's an interesting point of view. And you can see that London is not atypical anymore. We live in a world where uh, certain kinds of city, city regions are pulling in talent and they are growing in population and wealth compared to other territories. And it's important to, uh, to understand what a radical change this is in many countries from much of the um, late 20th century. Between the, the Second World War and, and the mid 80s or maybe the early 90s, uh, London, like many cities in the Western world, lost population, lost talent, and fell in terms of its economic standing. Many people might not remember, but the glittering island of Manhattan today was bankrupt in the mid-1970s. And in the 1980s, it was considered to be dirty, crime-ridden, uh, full of criminality, um, and it was the suburbs that had the kind of the gloss and the glitter. So this is important to remember as a perspective that in many countries, uh, in the second half of the 20th century, it was the suburbs, it was the exurbs, uh, the smaller metropolitan areas, and even rural areas that won uh, population. And their incomes grew faster than those of big cities. Uh, and indeed, in, for example, countries such as um, Britain or the United States of America, it was the outer suburbs that were the richest territories in uh, those countries. And big cities went down. So in the middle, and, in middle of the 20th century until roughly the late 1980s, we used to think about big cities as being in crisis, having problems, having poverty, having ghettos, having criminality, drug traffic. What were we going to do to save the cities, right? Um, and uh, this is no longer how we see things in 2016, right? So here's the, here's the picture. Now this is a stylized kind of summary picture. There could be differences from one country to another, but the, th the three countries that I use as reference points in much of my research are uh, the United Kingdom, France, 
and the United States of America. And I think we could characterize the economic geography of those three countries and probably a few others as one of currently divergence and turbulence. So what do I mean by those? First of all, metro areas now attract more people and have increasingly high incomes compared to everywhere else. Again, that's a change. To give you just an example, in the last five years alone, the New York metropolitan area increased its population by 450,000 people. Right? That's its net in migration. And that's not atypical. San Francisco did it, LA did it, Boston did it, Washington DC did it, London even more so. Um, the second, so that's the first kind of divergence of territories. <clears throat> the second kind of divergence is that the bigger metropolitan areas are now the relative winners, and especially those that have a lot of what we call new economy uh, ac economic activities. They have higher incomes than other metropolitan areas. So there's an income hierarchy among metropolitan areas. Third, the biggest metropolitan areas have the highest productivity. And there's what's an emerging and increasing productivity gap between big metropolitan areas and everywhere else. Uh, London's productivity is 176% that of Great Britain's. Uh, it's roughly similar for New York, San Francisco, Washington, relative to the average productivity of the American economy. Here's another thing that shocks us a bit. Inner metropolitan areas are creating more jobs and income than suburbs and exurbs. That's a complete reversal from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And to cap this off, so that's four forms of measurable divergence. And then we might say that there's a churn or a, or a turbulence in uh, economic geography, which is to say that some, that some metro areas that were high income and growing previously are now falling down the income ladder, while some that were lower income are now moving up. So there's a, se a selective pattern within the overall uh, process of divergence. This gives you kind of an, a, a graphic for America. All it does is it combines population on the uh, horizontal axis and um, the, the growth of per capita personal income for metropolitan areas on the vertical axis, and you get different combinations. So in the upper left, you get uh, high income growth, not very high population growth. The, the lines are the median for, uh, for America. So you get four different kinds of cases. Up in the upper right, you get fast population growth and fast income growth. Lower right, fast, fast population growth, less, less well on the income growth. Lower left, generally speaking, those are the catastrophe cases of the ones that are falling down the ladder. But we see all these, the point is that we see lots of patterns of growth within the overall pattern of the ascent of metropolitan areas and of inner metropolitan areas. That's just another example of this turbulence and selectivity for America. You take the top 10 metropolitan areas in terms of income in 1970, and why 1970? Because that's when the new world that we live in today starts to come into being. 1970 is the 1972 is the uptick of globalization. 1970, roughly the beginning of the IT revolution. 1970s, the abandonment of the post-war Bretton Woods International Monetary Order and the beginning of the financialization of the economy. Uh, we could go on and on, but it's the breaking point. It's the old economy versus new economy. And look at what happens, is that just in a single country, city regions, they go up, they go down, they move all over the place. So that's kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting kind of set of differences. Um, you can see similar things in Great Britain. So all this does is it shows um, in, the, in the solid blue line, that's the greater southeast, which includes London. And you can see growth gaps from 1971 to today between that and the rest of Britain, which is in the red line. Um, so, 
This is what now in economic geography, we have some phrases that we use to try and capture these events or these processes. One is the great inversion, the switch from non-metropolitan or outer metropolitan to inner metropolitan, from smaller metropolitan to bigger metropolitan. Uh, we also call it, a uh, colleague uh, at Berkeley calls it the new geography of jobs. These are capturing this kind of sea change in, in dynamics. So we know that metropolitan areas are attracting skilled people and they have these increasingly high uh, incomes relative to other territories. And this is, in many ways, shaped by powerful migratory forces. What are these migration forces? First of all, it's very dependent on social class um, and, and education, which correspond to one another. The best educated people, and generally speaking, those who are in the higher income brackets, go to cities and they go to big cities. Um, this, in the case of North America, of the USA really contrasts to other great American migrations. Notably, the great American migration from the 40s to the 1980s when the migration was from the north or what's called the Rust Belt, the old industrial areas, to the newly industrializing areas of the south. Everywhere from Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, through Texas and through uh, the southwest. That was a huge flow of population of lesser skilled people, mostly leaving the uh, old manufacturing economy and seeking opportunity and cheap housing in what's called the Sun Belt. Current migrations are different. Current migrations, that's going on in the background, but the real inversion is the talent getting sucked up by the cities. The other thing that's happening <coughs> is across the developed world, migration is now screeching to a halt. It's been very strong for the last uh, 50, 60 years, but we see in America, in Britain, in France, internal migration is slowing way down in the last four or five years. Now, I'll come back to that. Um, again, I mentioned this already, but I think it bears <coughs> repeating. This growth in gap of, in, of per capita income between metropolitan areas and especially the new economy ones and the rest. So you can see those figures of the, this is just the gap between cities and the national economy. So this is territorial economic inequality in a very, a very sharp uh, expression. New York 80% above to 172% above. Okay, so this great inversion, I think what we can say is, 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 is now in 2016, what we are seeing is sharp political expressions of the great inversion. Great inversion is of course economic, we'll see that it has some sociological dimensions, but what is common to Brexit and the election of Donald Trump in America is a revolt against globalization and the rise of a new nationalist politics. And this nationalist politics is strongly place-based in, and it's place-based in France, in America and in the United States. Indeed, we are, many people are beginning to, to, to phrase uh, or to think about this kind of expression as a realignment of the world of politics in many Western countries from the traditional cleavages of left and right to something that is more, um, more, more place-based and less strictly class-based. Class hasn't disappeared but it's not taking the same kinds of expressions. Many people are, are, are saying that what we're seeing is something like two worlds, separate worlds coming into existence in many countries. One which is territories that are globalist, cosmopolitan, educated, skilled political majorities versus other places that are localist, nationalist, less educated majorities. This is not, and this doesn't map strictly onto left and right. It maps, it maps both socially and geographically differently. So I'll come back to this, but let's, 
a question we can ask is, if this is in fact the case, what does it mean for the future of national cohesion? When one has, uh, when one has political differences that are emerging in a sharply place-based way, rather than say social class, but r relatively evenly distributed across territories. What does it mean about future attitudes toward globalization, European integration, and many other issues? Um, these are just some, some easy visuals on this. Um, the Brexit vote was very sharply uh, correlated to average wages. Uh, the lower the average wages, the higher vote to, to, to leave the European Union. It's um, very highly uh, inversely correlated. Uh, remain votes in Britain were those people who have uh, university degrees. They vote against. The people without university degrees vote to leave. Um, Residents with qualifications, that means some kind of professional qualification, uh, they vote to stay in the EU, the others vote to leave. And it's sharply, and these have strong regional gradients with a very low vote in uh, London and, uh, and in Scotland, in certain parts of Scotland, and a high vote in, the, the, in other areas. This isn't this year, this is 2012 in America. And this is um, so blue in America. This is odd because red means right wing in America rather than socialist, right? So you've got to kind of switch from the European color scheme. But this is 2012, not the, not the Trump election. But already what we saw in, um, uh, this is 2000, Sorry, this is 2003, excuse me, I got went back. Um, we already saw a very sharp division in the contest between John Kerry and George Bush in essentially a series of blue counties. That's so America is divided into its basic territorial unit. It's a state, but even more fundamentally is the county. And there are 3,114 of them, I think. Um, and you can see that there's a very distinctive geography here, mostly of, of essentially it's, it's a few metropolitan areas, and uh, I'll explain this a little later, some other regions. But you can see an amazing, amazing split there. And it turns out that the blue places are heavily populated. Right? So there's actually a lot of people in a little land. There's a lot of people and a lot of jobs in a very small land area in America. 40% of the employment is on 1.5% of the land area, and 60% of the employment in America is on 12% of the land area. Right? So this is kind of a basic unevenness of population and jobs. But I want to point out that this, what I'm talking about here, has been brewing. It didn't come about this year. It's been brewing uh, basically in the new millennium, we might say. And I'll argue in a minute that it has to do with the maturing of forces of globalization and technological change and how they work territorially. Um, <clears throat> same thing. So this is 2012 in France. And the darker the color, the more votes for the uh, right-wing nationalist party, which is known as the Front National, right? That's the vote for uh, Marine Le Pen, who will be a strong presidential candidate in France uh, next year. And you get two big uh, regions <laughs> of, uh, of favoring her. So we're seeing a pattern that is um, common across several different countries. Now, let's hope that this works. Uh, okay, I have some links that I want to show you. Okay, great, I think it's gonna work, wonderful. Okay, now, so this is the vote, uh, this is the recent vote just a few weeks ago uh, for, uh, this is the vote by states in America. I'm, I would guess a lot of you have seen this, right? It's the, it's the kind of shot hurled, heard around the world. This is the, the Hillary Clinton vote is blue, the Donald Trump vote is, um, is red, and the darker ones are the states that supported Obama before but switched to Trump this time. 
And of course, you see a very distinctive geography here. It's, it's a little crude, and of course, the, 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 the better representation is, uh, well, first of all, we have, you have a bunch of statistics here, but to summarize them, what you have is, country, uh, is places that's, that, that polarized, that became more like what they were becoming in the early 2000s. The more blue became bluer, the red became redder, and some switched from one camp uh, to another. We'll, we'll explain that in a minute. The other thing to look at is, uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, oh, I think it's up here, sorry. Um, I'm looking for right counties. Okay. So again, sort of like that map I showed you a minute ago of 2003, what you have is, this is a slightly a, 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 a better map in that it takes the counties and the darkness of the, respectively, of the red or blue tells you the intensity or the, uh, of the vote. So let me point out um, a few things that may not be evident to <coughs> to a non-North American audience. First, of course, so all of these states go blue, but they're, what you're really seeing here are intensely metropolitan votes on the West Coast and on the Northeast Coast. Those are just basically you know, Boston, New York, Washington, Philadelphia, and then they are Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, LA. And these are extremely strongly Democratic Party areas. Right? Um, so Manhattan voted 87% for Hillary Clinton. My neighborhood in, uh, in Los Angeles voted 91% for Hillary, right? So these are, that's because I live in, you know, a, I live in a, in a bobo bubble, of course, like, you know, like a privileged academic that I am. Um, you see those, a few other things. So there are even, even in this region of America, right, which is the, what we call the Old South, Right, the, this is the most conservative, historically conservative part of America, right, for long-term, uh, you know, kind of long durée re reasons. Here, the blue basically is African Americans. These are the, the, the pockets of extremely high African American population that are left over from the, basically from the slavery plantation periods. And so you get majorities of African Americans, they're, they're not particularly urban, but they're not going to vote for Donald Trump, right? Uh, same thing. Same thing here. These are these are African American public, and this is a, this is basically a um, a Latin American population. It's on the Mexican border. But aside from those exceptions, which are ethnic, the big uh, the big pattern is metropolitan versus the rest. Okay. So this is a, a, a political expression of. Um, what we're, what we're seeing. Now, um, and then I think one last thing to show here is, okay, so this represents it, I think, the New York Times is doing really good cartography. I'm very jealous of them. As an academic, I go, how can this newspaper do better than we do in academia? But this real, this shows you another, a, a, we geographers know this, a good visual. Um, you can see where the intense uh, m uh, pluralities of votes come for each candidate. And what's striking about the, the Democratic candidates is, is that they come from a few big metropolitan areas where you see this, p th this pattern of a more spread out, territorially much more spread out pattern for uh, Donald Trump. Um, and of course it was narrowly a minoritarian actually, but in the weird American electoral system. Can you explain the graph? Yeah. yeah, so this is just, this is, the circle size is proportionate to each county's leading candidates, um, to how, how much uh, plurality there was for each candidate in each place. So you're seeing a combination of how, how much the lead was in percentage points, but also how big the place is. 
So the two biggies, of course, are going to be LA, right? Which has um, 18 million people but voted 70% for Hillary, right? Whereas these little dots are smaller places uh, with uh, smaller absolute leads but high percentage leads. Okay, and here, of course, is very, this is another great graphic. I wish I thought of this one, too. So what this shows is, you see these little arrows, and what they are showing is, uh, if the arrows are blue, the Democrats get more votes between 2012 and now, and if they're red, <coughs> the Republicans get them. And you can see, really, it's like an impressionist painting, right? But you can see uh, nicely where, uh, what the pattern is. The pattern is, it's, it's, it's metropolitan areas on the west coast. This is an urbanizing area of uh, Colorado, plus a bunch of sort of highly educated, hiker, backpacker, you know, wealthy, kind of, you know, groovy hip people. And then, <coughs> then the typical, excuse, this is Atlanta, which is both wealthy and black. Uh, Houston, Dallas, uh, Dallas, Austin, and then the East Coast quarter. But it's amazing how much of America is red. Territorially, there's a lot of red out there, right? But there's an intensity of population and people highly concentrated who are blue. So it, it, it's what I call, it, it's really the separate worlds phenomenon. Okay, now. Um, I wanna, okay, I want to show you, right, another one. Let's see, how do I do that? Uh, right, I think it, it might work. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so again, this is another one of those things where you can see a really nice graphic of the, 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 um, of the distribution of vote by the size of the unit. But, it, but the one that I wanted to show you mostly was this one, which is population density and the vote by county. Very simply, the Democrats get votes in dense places, the Republicans get vote, votes in places that are less dense. Okay, so this is the new, this is emerging as, uh, as a pattern. And it's not just America, it's France, it's Britain, and uh, I haven't looked at it in, in detail at other countries, but my guess is that around Europe, we're seeing uh, this pattern uh, emerge. So, county level shows the real picture, rural versus urban, metropolitan versus the rest. In America, mostly the Northeast Corridor and West Coast and major metros and then these other concentrations. In the UK, it's the greater Southeast versus the rest. In France, it's, uh, it's the region of uh, Paris. Uh, and perhaps uh, we'll see next year, but it's gonna be, I think, Lyon, Nantes, Bordeaux, Toulouse versus the rest. Okay, now, so is this a geographical fracture? <coughs> It's about inequality, but what kind of inequality is it about? This, I think, is something we are only beginning to understand. The political expression, what is it channeling? What kind of, what kind of difference in, uh, in reality is uh, causing people to have such different worldviews? Um, we know, of course, because since the 1980s in academia, we've been talking about interpersonal inequality rising across a set of countries. And we know that it's because of technological change and trade and policy. There's a variety of forces that have caused inequality to rise across the developed West and in some of the emerging economies. Um, <coughs> now, um, Inequalities, well, that's just a, that's, we don't, we don't need to talk about that. So there's, 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 there's a growth in inequality. It's actually across the economy. But what I mean is, it's everywhere. It's not only in rural areas, it's in New York City or Los Angeles or Paris too. Indeed, uh, 
paradoxically, um, this is so. This is for uh, America. We take 52 major metropolitan areas, and what what what, what I want to point out to you here is that the urban, the center parts, the center parts of urban areas have higher interpersonal in income inequality than any other part of the American territory. And yet, here's the funny question. Those people, the areas with the highest inequalities, they vote for the Democrats. The areas with the lowest interpersonal inequalities vote for Trump. Okay, so in other words, there's something about this inequality that is not simply the maybe the model that we've inherited in social science that I'm angry against the current order because I live in a place where there's a lot of inequality between people. The territorial expression is channeling something else. Um, now, um, th I, this is a bit out of order. This is just simply telling you that this is, big, this is uh, the cities in the European Union and what it's doing is showing you, I should have told you this earlier, but I guess I messed up my slides. These are the rich, richest, highest income city regions in Europe. You go down, we just basically stratified them and you can see where the people are going in Europe too, okay? Um, now, okay, so back to my main story is, so it's a strange thing because in the most unequal areas, so that's Paris and London and New York and LA and San Francisco and Washington DC, these places have incredibly high Gini coefficients on their income. Um, people are still voting massively for openness and economic liberalism. In the least locally unequal areas, the problem, now they have lower income levels, but they are, they are locally more egalitarian societies. But I think what, what's happening there, it's a guess, is that in those places, the income levels relative to the rich, to the other places have declined. And what they have is probably most importantly, a problem with employment creation. And I think even perhaps more importantly, what we might call relative status decline. So um, it's inequality between areas in what we might call the opportunity aspects of the society, not just income, right? It's not a narrow map from income to dissatisfaction, right? And it's something about status and culture. I'll come back to this. So I think sort of a first point I want to make is that as we try to begin to understand these complex issues, we need to avoid what I have already seen as I think an oversimplification that there's some kind of direct link between how unequal the local society is and how satisfied or dissatisfied the people are. Um, so, I think we need to go still further and now let's sort of take that as a starting point and maybe further disaggregate what's going on. I would say that at least what I'm guessing is going on in America, Britain, and France is a common, uh, the, common the common sort of political um, expression going on is nationalism. <coughs> But nationalism, of course, means different things and has different roots in various regions. So let's say, take the case of, uh, of America, and this kind of tracks what I said a minute ago. I think there's actually two, two, two main kinds of regional expressions that went into the vote for Donald Trump. One is what I would call a deep, long-term, reactionary or conservative culture, which is the US South and the rural Midwest. And the parallel to that in France would be the Southeast of France. That's Provence and the Côte d'Azur, okay? These are areas that have long-term structural and migratory and other processes that make them very, I'll put it kind of bluntly, rather adverse to modernity. Uh, in the U.S. South, it's of course the history of a slave to plantation society that 
it, there is a long historical process of trying to undo uh, that history. Many of you may know, going back to a, a major war in the 1860s, but then to an entire century of reconstruction of segre racially segregated institutions that only really began to be desegregated a half century ago and are still kind of, we might say, midway in that, in that process. Uh, and there's other things that go on in these regions. We'll come back to that. But, um, uh, uh, for example, extremely heavy uh, uh, evangelical Protestant religious culture in the, in the rural areas and the south of America compared to the rest. So that's one, I think, one source of this is that those regions, they're going to, they're, they have a problem with, uh, we might say, um, progressive modernity in general. And, and they vote pretty consistently over long periods of time, but probably in America, they, 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 uh, they hardened their positions because they just had eight years of a black president and it made them angry. Um, I think the different story and that made Donald Trump get elected in the narrowest sense is the Rust Belt of America. It's the northern states that are old industrial states and they flipped uh, from Democrat, they flipped from, they, they flipped from voting very strongly for Obama twice to voting strongly for Trump. And that's true of the northern French borderlands on Belgium and Germany, which used to be communist, and now they vote for the Front National. And it's also true of the north of England that used to be solidly Labour Party and now is voting UK Independence Party and for Brexit. So these are areas that are flipping because things happen to them that are both economic and cultural. So we need something like, I think, a transformation matrix to get from economics and economics, the, 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 the geography of economics, and then onto these political expressions. We have to be very careful about, um, about making the links and trying to figure out exactly what are the, tran the, the channels of transmission. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just throw out what I think are five channels of transmission that we as researchers really need to understand today. So the first is what I've actually talked about. It's that there's a basic economic geography of the new, uh, new economy since 1970. It culminates in this great inversion that globalization and technological change and the composition of contemporary capitalism strongly favor the concentration of high, highly skilled industries and people in metropolitan areas and more and more in the center of metropolitan areas. So that's number one, but let's go on to others. I think there's a cyclical element in it and it has to do with the Great Recession from 2008 to 2015. In, it depends of course on exactly what country we're talking about, but generally this recession hit certain people harder than others. And it hit in America, notably through the housing market. Um, so um, people who were, it hit everybody in America in all regions, meaning the housing market uh, went very bad and a lot of people lost housing value or lost uh, their houses. But in people who were in dynamic metropolitan areas, if they were able to get through the crisis, their housing values have now recovered, okay? However, those who had both a debt, a, be, a debt crunch, meaning they were over indebted in 2008. And that was true a lot in Britain, it was true a lot in America. But who also live in these regions that are less favored by the contemporary economy, okay? So this economic geography of development is, 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 uh, is acting in those regions. Basically, they find themselves stuck. To put it bluntly, their housing values never recovered. And many of them actually lost their houses, okay? They are decapitalized and possibly homeless. Um, and therefore, and this is the most important thing, now that the economy is more and more pulling talent to the big cities, 
these people find themselves more stuck than ever before because they can't get much out of their old houses and the gap in housing values between outlying regions and urban regions is so big today compared to the 1970s, 80s, and 90s that it impedes migration. And that's one of the big reasons that migration is screeching to a halt in the developed countries is because the housing, the housing market effects of the new economy have matured to the point where housing is no longer, un, uh, uh, is no longer uh, helping people to be mobile. In the old days, people would go to places where housing was cheap. Now, that's over. So, um, inter-regional inter mobility is declining, right? So this long-term concentration of wealth in metro areas, increasing these housing price gaps, is, is changing the dynamic. Let me sort of repeat that. In the early part of the process, people would move to places with more jobs and relatively cheap housing. No longer possible, okay? The other thing that's going on, I think, is that skills are becoming more territorially uh, dependent. Now, what do I mean by that? It's actually kind of a paradox. One would think that in a world of diplomas, that, uh, and with a standardization of educational uh, outputs, that you get a degree in one region, and you take, that, you take that degree, and you go where the demand for your skills is. But paradoxically, we're f and that seemed to work for a number of decades, we expanded educational systems so that if you were in an area that wasn't you know, super wealthy, but you got educated, you'd move, with your, you'd move with your degree. And that worked for a number of decades. But now, we see in uh, urban economics that skills are becoming more and more dependent not only on your formal diploma, even a higher education diploma, but on your networks. It's who you know. The new economy is about, is just as much about your social capital and who you know and who you met as it is about having the piece of paper that says you have the formal training. So we have a new geography of, we might say, stratification of the labor market between the people who are in the places that are very dynamic and they meet the right people and they get into these circles where they can network versus the people who come from other areas and don't know the right people. Okay, so we're getting a system of spatial traps, but not the ones that we have traditionally thought about. Um, we used to, at least in America, think about spatial traps being the black ghetto in the city, right? These people were isolated, you know, they didn't have connections, there was segregation, they were victims of all kinds of you know, oppressive political uh, and economic processes. Now we're seeing a system of spatial traps, but that's at a much larger, almost national scale, meaning that as social and economic decline occur in the, e for example, here in the EU, with deindustrialized regions, or in the US, both in the old frost belt or rust belt deindustrialized regions, and this is the new news, is the American South is now deindustrializing. It was industrializing in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s because jobs moved from the north to the south because America has a lot, of, a lot of land and a huge internal frontier and wages are lower in the south. They don't have any unions and it's historically less developed so you could be in a, a firm that would move say from Michigan to South Carolina, you could cut your wages just like moving to a developing country. But that's over. And it's over because now the firms move directly from wherever they are to China or to Mexico. So deindustrialization has now had two waves in the north of America and it's having a wave even in the areas, and this is true of central France and it's true also of the north of England. These places for a while benefited from de-agglomeration uh, de from major cities, but that's over. So what's going on in these areas is now we have that and we have the fact that in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, a lot of the talented moved out 
both individuals but also families, they moved to the major metropolitan areas. So now what we get is a social transformation of these regions that's completely different from what was going on even 20 or 30 years ago. We're getting intergenerational transmission of educational and social network failure in vast areas of Great Britain, France, and America. So it's trapping more and more people, and it's trapping even younger people, because they're coming from families that no longer have the resources to get them into school, or no longer have the kind of sociological tools to encourage them to study. There's a whole set of issues going on there. So we're seeing this astonishing thing going on of the new map of social pathologies in, uh, especially in America, it goes something like this. The rural areas that have a lot, a very high majority of less educated white people, sorry, that's kind of a brutal American racialized terminology, but America is a highly racialized society, so you might as well use, I think, uh, it's an accurate terminology to describe its history. What we have is an incredible inversion where in the old days we looked for these social pathologies like, say, low educational achievement achievement or um, fa broken families, high levels of childhood um, poverty, uh, drug use, uh, uh, health gaps to the rest of the population. Those were the things, the image of which several decades ago was, let's look in the urban ghettos. In the USA today, we look in the majority white working class areas where there are epidemics of things like um, morphine derivative drug use um, and strikingly health outcomes so that you have, um, you have uh, gaps in life expectancy that open up, have opened up between less dense uh, areas with a majority of white working class people and the rest of the population, including the urban, uh, even the urban poor, have, have uh, improving health outcomes compared to the rural white working class. This isn't exactly the same, it's not the same in France because we have a good national health care system that pretty much re reaches everybody. But it is definitely true in the US and it seems to be true at a lesser scale uh, in Great Britain, which is kind of a, an intermediate case. So, so there's something going on here that's really quite different from our images of territorial economic and social development from just a couple of decades ago. I think a third source uh, of, of this is uh, maybe there's a, we might say, a conjunctural or like cyclical uh, contribution to the new nationalism. Um, we have j really just recently learned, and here I'm talking about those areas that you saw on the map a few minutes ago that flipped from Obama to uh, Trump. Um, we, of course, have been looking for many decades for the effects of trade, globalization, on jobs and incomes. And we know that they're important. But for the most part, it's kind of an interesting debate among economists. The more economists have studied the issue of trade and incomes, the consensus in, in economics is that trade is not the big generator of, uh, in, of inequality in Western societies. Um, it's maybe a third of the, of the measured increase in inequality. The big, the big force is technological change. Um, meaning that uh, technologies change the demand for uh, who works and what wages they work at. More than trade, more than import competition, it's technology. That's, that's pretty much a consensus in the economics profession. But what that, what that doesn't tell you is whether there might be some local or geographical exceptions to that overall observation, and we now know that there are. So for example, in America, in the, after 2000, there was a very strong import shock from the trade, from um, imports from China that, that hit the American economy overall in a pretty mild way, but it hit certain territories and certain groups of people quite strongly. 
right? So that these people who are hit by this uh, really um, find themselves in a, in, in a condition of high local unemployment and an inability to either get reemployed or to transition into jobs that were as good as the ones they held before. So there's some kind of really strong post-2000 local effect of trade and it affects certain territories of, of, of countries, but, n but in a way that kind of washes out if you look at the country as a whole. That's really important. Um, and the fourth, I think, I've kind of mentioned this, but I want to come back to it. Uh, a political geography of the new nationalism, I think it's more than just economics, or it's economics intersecting with what we might call <laughs> sociological or, as my sociology friends tell me, a constructivist approach. Meaning that there's some kind of way that different territories are now constructing collective narratives of what the world looks like today. So um, we have in America uh, a phrase that we, that we use called the big sort, um, which is that we observed starting in the 90s that there was more and more um, uh, kind of more and more people locating, uh, especially interregionally and locally, according to what we might call affinities, such as I want to live in a place where um, I want to live in a place that is well the old history of America. You know, there's racial sorting, so that's a big affinity. But also more subtly, things like I want to live in a conservative place, or I want to live in a more progressive place, or I want to live uh, where so-called family values exist, or I want to live where there's a lot of gay people, or I want to live where there's a lot of artists. So there's this kind of affinity, and it's measurable. It's really strong uh, in the USA. Now, the thing is, though, that these things have always existed. I don't think it's anything totally new to uh, human uh, behavior. But there is clearly an emergence in, a, in the States and in Britain and in France of a new narrative about uh, white people. About white people who are, we might say, generally speaking, not the highly trained urban white professionals, but some combination of people who don't have advanced degrees or the traditional, we might say, sort of shopkeeper or, or, or petite bourgeoisie. And these people are, they have narratives, and the narratives are highly territorialized because it's where they live. And you, you, you get an, an interesting emergence of titles emerging in uh, the sociological literature in America with things like this. Strangers in our own land voyage into the political extreme right, which is a book that a friend of mine wrote about Louisiana, about deep Louisiana, or white trash, which is a, an, a, it's an abusive and very pejorative phrase designed to be provocative, but it's about, it's about poor white people. So um, I think what we're seeing is, and we, 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 of course, some of this is produced by political entrepreneurs who are trying to harness the energy of people and give them narratives. But we do see some kind of very sudden emergence of what we might call that globalist, cosmopolitan, multiculturalist sort of uh, narrative about what is a good society that is highly urbanized, and then another narrative about tradition. A it's, it's a nostalgic, we might say in the, in the true sense of the word, it's a reactionary narrative because it's a reaction to urban cosmopolitan modernity, but you know, that's a big part of human life. Um, and we're seeing that. And I think that maybe it's slightly, it's maybe not quite as radical in Europe um, because there's a kind of, a, you know, there's a sort of a sort of rules of the game, at least up till now, about what you can say. But, um, but we saw this very much uh, in, in, um, in our uh, primary, in, uh, in the election we just had in France, a primary election where the, the person who won, François Fillon, is openly uh, constructing a narrative that is rural, uh, rural Catholic traditionalist against this kind of perceived um, urban multiculturalist. And he says, he says, I need a national narrative for being French. Un récit national. He says that explicitly. Okay? So, um, 
again, I mentioned this. Um, there's, this is going back to my point about sort of two different dynamics, but they sort of converge in America. The deep red parts, that's the Old South, they have this endearing culture. Uh, and the influence, I think, of racial uh, segregation is strong, traditionally low levels of education, um, low ongoing investment in education, poor social services and poor governance, and little political support for improving them. Uh, if you look at, if you rank American states by the quality of government that they have, the ones that are the most poorly governed tend to be the ones that vote furthest for the right. The ones that are well governed and have low levels of corruption vote for the left. Um, again, though, um, so that's, that's one part, but um, there's something else that's going on in recent years, which is a, this sorting process where uh, it's become a kind of, um, it's become a kind of anti-establishment resentment narrative that is being constructed in many of these territories, kind of almost grafting itself onto the deep uh, long-term uh, tr uh, tendencies. The old Rust Belt that flipped, I think, is a slightly different story because these areas, as I mentioned, they voted for Obama in 2008 and 2012, um, but the narrative, uh, the narrative construction is very interesting. <laughs> When, uh, when Barack Obama became president, he inherited a banking system that was crashing really day by day. And he, of course, immediately had to save the, uh, the American and world financial system, which he did by bringing in the usual uh, crew of managers from the, from the Clinton camp. So these people saved the banks, but Obama himself said in an interview about a month ago, he said, I wish we had done more to keep people from being expelled from their houses. And that's because his Secretary of the Treasury discouraged him from putting a lot of political energy into trying to, um, uh, trying to restrict the banks from taking property about because he had a standard economic analysis that it would probably be, that the idea from the, from the housing economics side was it would be better to just get that property unloaded onto the market and it would turn the housing market around faster. What he didn't count on was that the people who lost their houses would be extremely angry and would come back and vote against the Democrats which is what happened this year. Because the, what's called the Tea Party was born exactly on that issue and exactly at that time. So it's not really, and so I think this is a really important point. It's why I'm giving you the detail. This is not deep, long-term social conservatism or racism against multicultural Obama. That's not Michigan, it's not Minnesota, it's not Ohio, it's not Pennsylvania, it's not even Virginia. And it's not even the center areas of, Fr of France like, um, like Burgundy or, or the southeast, uh, southwest of France or even the northern borderlands. That's not the issue. The issue is that there's a perception that the highly educated professional classes who are basically in the center left of many countries, probably people like us, right, with diplomas and professional skills and a high level of literacy, that we are somehow uh, betraying uh, these classes who don't understand what we do anymore and don't understand why their lives aren't getting any better or they perceive them as not getting any better. I think it's really two things then that are coming together that have somewhat different territorial and somewhat different social expressions but they make for powerful coalitions. In France that would be the, the area of deep I would say social conservatism and racial resentment is in the southeast. These other areas that are not particularly historically racist or even right-wing are more something like feeling like betrayed by technological change and the movement of jobs to the city. They come together. And um, let's sort of add on, I just kind of go wild here and add on a fifth hypothesis, 
which is that nationalism, the, I think the nationalism part of this is, is, is really the common expression, the part we don't understand very much, but we will find out, I think, in the next few years is how much are these movements tempted by authoritarianism, right? So um, nationalist sentiments, of course, when they are channeled uh, due to this, this sort of anger against the contemporary world, the notion that it's some set of forces that are making people's lives not very good, um, we, can, we, we can see that that has some kind of, of interaction with old tendencies uh, to, toward democracy and toward authority. Um, so there are, there is in the new nationalism a kind of anti-establishment sentiment that flirts with the notion that democracy is just a pain and doesn't work and doesn't make decisions very well and what we really need are strong leaders who are going to come in and clean this up and do good things for us, right? Trump clearly has that in his personality and so does Marine Le Pen. Um, so we don't really know what that's all about, but the interesting thing we've seen in, uh, political scientists in America have shown that authoritarian attitudes are of course strongest in the states and localities of America where governance is the poorest. Meaning that places where the institutions don't work very well actually do correspond to a kind of an anger against democracy in general. Right? Whereas in the relatively well-governed states and cities, uh, people may not be satisfied with everything, but they feel that the, the governance is somehow has outputs that they can understand and measure uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a regular, effective way. So this is a very interesting, and it has a, a clear territoriality to it. Okay, so. I guess my main, my main sort of point here is that separate worlds seem to be emerging in terms of experience, worldview, um, and we see this radically in America, but I think also in France um, and Britain. I want to conclude with just a word about this. Uh, so I've tried to kind of give you, I think, what I would call uh, a, a kind of a new problematic for uh, economic geography. But um, part of the work that, that, uh, that I do, the people in, in my part of economic geography do, is we try, to, we try to think in terms of policy construction, uh, whether it's here in Europe or in North America, which is you know, what should be you know, the mix of policies that we would use to try and shape the forces of globalization, technological change in a positive way for economic and social development. That's, I think, a reasonable task for economic geographers. Um, I would say this, so um, we, we, we now are in a really delicate situation where the new nationalism principally is channeled by politicians who argue that, they argue to the people, your problem is globalism. Your problem is trade. Your problem basically is China, okay? But the consensus, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, in, in economics, is that the direct trade impacts are probably, let's well, at a maximum of a third of this problem. Technological change is 50 to 60 percent, and interactions between globalization and technological change are the rest. Um, this is a technical field, but, but it's pretty well mapped out now in, uh, by, in economics and geography. So the new nationalism is basically sort of misdirected, right? In terms of potential policy solutions, uh, it's really, it's telling the people that the problem is here, but it probably isn't there. Or as Senator Cory Booker, who's from New Jersey, uh, he said it, well, how do you build a wall against a microchip, right? Um, there are the exceptions that I mentioned. There are locally heavy impacts of trade, and we probably have been, we've probably missed that as a problem, and as a result, we, by missing that, I do think that in regional policy, we failed to understand that locally, these impacts could be really heavy, and we probably should have done something about them long ago. 
Um, but there's a bigger there's a bigger debate, which is now that we're in this world, uh, what do we do? Do we keep let cities sort of keep as as as, this, as the phrase goes, let cities rip, just let them go, um, and other areas either empty out or become poorer with this spatial trap? Because now we know. Here's the problem. Implicitly, a lot of economics and economic geography has been implicitly or explicitly saying this problem will disappear because basically the talented people, everyone will move somewhere. They'll either get a new job or they'll get new skills or they'll literally move. But now we know that that's not happening to the extent that we thought it would. Traditionally, up till now, we've had this really sharp division. Um, there tend to be economists on the one side who will say, all of our policies for adjusting to the world of globalization and technology are about people, education, skills, um, giving people sort of like portable human capital, and then they'll kind of move into the new economy and things will be fine. Geographers um, and sociologists have more been tempted by what we might call place-based approaches, right? Geographers didn't formulate it, I think, in a way that economists could hear it, because we talk different languages frequently. But um, what we're seeing is that right now, Everyone is surprised, even the geographers were surprised by the degree of spatial trap and the degree of separate worlds that are emerging. So there's, I think, a new, a, a new, a new world of thinking about policy where we now know that we can't treat place-based approaches and people-based uh, people approaches as something like one or the other as a trade-off, but that we know that we have to do both of them. So place-based approaches, I think, are back, as it were, on the map. Um, the, the problem here, and this is, I think, very much true of Europe, where we've had a very aggressive uh, program of regional policy, meaning the cohesion funds of the European Union, is um, we've, um, we've got some of this wrong. So I mentioned these are the spatially neutral means uh, people-based. I changed terminology. You know, the notion is we should just make it easier for people to work. That's not for uh, to, to move. That's not working anymore. Um, we should. We need to address barriers for people moving into dynamic places, but we don't know how to do that anymore because it turns out that merely giving people, as I mentioned, diplomas, that doesn't work. Um, we talk a lot about taking the less advantaged populations and giving them job training, but almost everywhere that we do it, it's too little, it's too expensive, or it's too ineffective. Denmark does it, it's about the only country that does it successfully, but it costs 4% of their, of their PIB. Uh, Britain spends 0.27% of its PIB, the US spends 0.4%, France spends 0.3%. So what do we need to multiply it by a factor of 15 or 20, but who's going to do that, right? Where are we going to get the budget for? Place-based, we have, what have we been doing? We talk about entrepreneurship everywhere, but of course, we now know, I'll put it kind of bluntly, that doesn't work in outlying areas. It throws some money at localities, but let's tell the truth. Most of the young entrepreneurs, they're in cities, because that's where you do entrepreneurship these days. And another kind of politically correct discourse we have in the European Union is, under the <clears throat> Lisbon agenda, is innovation everywhere, right? R&D and innovation everywhere. An absurdity if anyone ever thought of one. It corresponds to no reality of geography, uh, or, or the geography of innovation, and it doesn't work. So, we have a problem, we have a big problem. So here's, I guess what I would say is, I think regional policy is in crisis. We need a deep rethink both on both sides of the Atlantic, and that's provoked by, I think, this new situation that we find ourselves in. So, um, I could go on and make more comments there, but I think this is a good point to end on and to um, abrir a discussão com vocês. Muito obrigado. Okay, thanks very much for this exciting lecture, brilliant talk.
on the well still capital and labor <coughs> matter these geographies and are imprinting new political geographies too so uh, but uh, let's open the floor for some questions now I will take groups of questions and then is it okay? Uh, okay. Ah, Ricardo. Yes, please uh, mention your name and affiliation. Ricardo Mamed, Lisbon University Institute. I'm an economist, uh, by the way. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, most uh, stimulating uh, presentation. I think is the the most sophisticated approach I've heard until now uh, regarding the newest tendencies on uh, populism and nationalism. Uh, the debate until now has been actually too too, too simplistic. Um, I, I would like to ask you. Uh, well, to, to make a short comment, then ask you two questions. The short comment is, uh, I, I'm not sure if we should be uh, putting too much weight on the, the idea that of uh, globalization as um, the, 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 the thing we should criticize that led to what's happening. I mean, we can, can talk more generally about uh, neoliberalism or lack of of planning or leaving too much to the markets uh, as uh, one reason behind the, the present problems. Uh, globalization is only a part of it and even if, if we think about the great inversion as you talked about, uh, we can consider it as a part of a more general uh, trend towards uh, letting the markets deal with it and this might be a more general uh, problem and globalization would be part of this problem, right? So uh, to put it only in globalization, I mean, I'm, uh, uh, I criticize neoliberalism and I, I look at globalization as a part of it and not as uh, uh, from a nationalist point of view. Now, uh, my question uh, was the following. I have this, when looking, reading the, your five points, I have the sense that uh, aside the ones that regard the, 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 the crisis, the financial crisis in China, they all come uh, down to one single point, which is the, the problem of metropolitan areas, right? Because you, you seem to, even when you talk about constructivism, you seem to, to be basically suggesting that the fact that the the elites are running away through to, to the met metropolitan areas, uh, built to very different sociological groups in the countryside or in the, well, the metropolitan areas and non-metropolitan areas. So there seems to be a, a, a strong trend nowadays, which is uh, metropolitan areas are becoming a place where only some people get can get in, and this makes all the difference in many senses. Is this your basic idea? I mean, uh, are, is the, this trend to, to, towards metropolitan uh, area specificity uh, the big issue of uh, the present days? I'm sorry for taking too long, just three sec uh, 30 seconds. Uh, as an economist, I'm very interested in understanding your point, uh, your ideas about uh, migration. Uh, you you re refer that migration is the the decreasing of uh, migration internal migration in the U.S. is due to the uh, family de household debts uh, related to mort uh, mortgages and also due to network and social capital. Is this all the story behind the, the decreasing of migration? How relevant is this? How relevant will this be for you? Europe, because if migration doesn't work, uh, monetary union not only in uh, Europe but also in the US probably will collapse. Yes. Thanks. Rick. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ricardo. Okay, more questions? That's it. George? Yes? It's probably got migration. No, no, please. Mike, Mike, microphone, we are, we are, we are taping this. Thank you. Um, I yeah, like Ricardo. I like very much the the presentation. I think it's um, 
very coherent and uh, makes us think about a lot of things. And I, I want to pose you, let us say, two questions and then something else. And two questions are things which I felt a bit uncomfortable about. The first one is, you have demonstrated that talent is sucked by cities, and this is one of the reasons why now there is this change uh, in relation to what happened in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Now, if talented is sucked by cities, wouldn't that supposedly mean that we have a more equal population in cities, countering this idea that uh, income gaps and inequality is higher in cities? So if it is talented people, why we have more inequality? Because apparently this is, goes against these polarization theories that we had in the 90s about uh, you know, the top and the lower groups of the social structure being more represented in cities. So th th this is the first thing that looks like a paradox. The second one is, is more about um, culture and policy. If um, one of the claims that explains this shift towards voting at the right or to more, to more populist candidates is based in the kind of um, looking for the lost cultural unity or for the lost um, shared community values. How do we match this with the discourse, with the neoliberal discourse about individual freedom and individualism and so on? Where does that match? Is, is that dead? Let us say that this idea of neoliberalism is no longer an important thing for people and so they have moved to an, another moment in their uh, perceptions. So these are the two questions. The other thing is, do you, do you believe that we can use this analysis to other countries and other cities? Or just to these central ones like uh, US, uh, France, Britain, okay. eventually Germany? Can we use this for Southern Europe or uh, for other parts of the world? And finally, sorry, but uh, simulating presentations uh, lead us to ask several things. The other thing is about migration. You talked about internal migration, but I, I don't think that international migration is very much in the picture. And I believe that a very important part of the change in big cities is actually international migration. Because that is an enormous impact in talent, but also in things such as the uh, housing market, increases in the prices of housing market, and actually limiting the access of other people to these central parts of the cities. And I've, I don't know, right. working on migration, I felt that uh, a little little bit, uh, well, I expected that to be in the equations. Thank okay, you. thanks, George. Uh, two big questions from, is there anyone else? Uh, please, short if you don't mind, otherwise you don't get answers. <laughs> wait for the mic, wait. Sorry, wait, wait for, wait for the mic. <laughs> Okay, I, I was thanking for your presentation, which was very useful for me. Uh, I have a comment um, uh, regarding the consensus in the economic profession, because this consensus led us to things like the 2008 uh, financial crash in the West. So uh, I tend to look at it with a, a little bit of scepticism, so I, could, uh, I can broaden my questions and my analysis. And so perhaps some aspects of that uh, special trap uh, would not be such a surprise if uh, we look with uh, more broadened uh, ideas. Uh, another thing is about your um, uh, fifth uh, point uh, uh, regarding uh, authoritarianism. I think it's the word. Well, uh, like uh, Ricardo, I, t I tend to see globalization uh, quite as being uh, in a broader process of a political, uh, of international political economy. Uh, and it could uh, have uh, another uh, shape not this kind of uh, globalization that we have nowadays as a uh, neoliberal okay so um, uh, that is going to uh, uh, relates with this political question that uh, when you talked about authoritarianism you just talked about the new right-wing uh, nationalist movements 
but we could also look at some uh, aspects of this uh, nowadays globalization and the political systems in the West as uh, going towards authoritarianism progressively and in a continuous way. Some people would argue that nowadays we already have some kind of soft uh, authoritarianism, like for instance uh, when uh, uh, political uh, majorities that uh, express themselves dem democratically don't matter because you have supposedly international higher values that uh, conditionates these uh, supposedly democratic decisions, uh, like this uh, settlement, uh, this um, international settlement of uh, commercial disputes like CETA and TTIP tip and so on. It's just a, a, okay. a, an aspect. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I think we have... Yeah, good now. you mind? No. Sure. Sure. Should I respond? Or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, thank you for uh, all those uh, very interesting questions. So, um, um, I'll try to just go down, down the list. Um, I think we need, so first of all, I want to say that I was trying today to lay out <clears throat> what I think is a situation, to confront it with uh, evidence and models that we've sort of had for the last 20, 30 years, and to lay out a problematic and maybe something like a research agenda. So I don't actually have the answers to a lot of these questions that I asked. I was just trying to sort of hopefully sharpen our minds about what I think the questions are as they are emerging. With respect to, uh, for example, the first observation, w one issue we need actually to investigate is whether these movements are a reaction to what we might call a highly, let's call it liberal Anglo-Saxon type globalization, or whether they are due to the phenomenon itself, meaning the deep contours of globalization and technological change. I think there the contrast between France and Great Britain and America is instructive and perhaps troubling. France is not a typical neoliberal Anglo-Saxon country. We have a state that takes 57% of PIB. We have, an ex we have what's called a coma, I mean, it actually sounds like the Soviet Union. We have a commissaire pour les égalités territoriales. You know, it's like, the, you know, we have actually like a, a formal principle of territorial equality. We have an, ex an elaborate system of social welfare with portable benefits, with territorial formulas for making sure that everything is beautiful everywhere. And yet, so this couldn't be, in, in Western terms, more different from what we consider the sort of policy approach in, in the USA, and yet we get a lot of the same effects. So I don't have an answer to this, but what I do think is we, should, we really need to investigate it. And my sense of it is that, the, and this was sort of my conclusion, is that the kinds of approaches that we have toward the welfare state, but also toward regional policy, they just don't work anymore in the ways that they're supposed to against the combined forces of globalization and technological change. It's not a question of whether we have them or don't have them. It's that when we have them, they are no longer really, um, they are now no longer efficacious. But that's a question. Um, I think a couple of the questions were about migration. So, uh, we have evidence the interesting thing about the slowdown in migration is that it occurs across all age groups, all income classes, and all skill groups. So unlike in the past where we were able to uh, in understand internal migration according to those, um, those uh, 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 control factors, basically, <clears throat> they don't seem to work. Now, I'm not saying they're gone. I think we need more research on this. And many people are working on it. But the fact that it's, an, that it's a, it's a slowdown across the board in migration suggests to me the hypothesis that uh, something about the overall territorial arrangement of the system and barriers to entry, barriers to exit and barriers to entry uh, that are territorial have now 
come into being that are different from the ones we had in the past? It's a guess, uh, but I, and I think that research will, um, will have to go there and figure that out. The other thing that, of course, we have to figure out is, is how much of the slowdown in migration was due to the Great uh, Recession. Uh, some people say that it's due to that, and that some you know, that we'll go back, we'll we'll go back to we'll sort of mean revert over time, but that we're not there yet. Could be right, could be wrong. I don't know. Um, okay, so th I think the migration field is now one of the key ones. It's really back on the in a big way. It's on the agenda of understanding both the geography of economic development, but also we might say the social contours of, of development because migration as a mechanism seems to be changing the role that it has served traditionally, I think it's changing. Hypothesis, not proof. Um, okay, now, there was a point about inequality in cities. Of course, you're absolutely right. I did not mention uh, the various sources of why we have much higher Gini coefficients in these successful and growing metropolitan areas. Part of them have to do with international migration, which is to say that there's a polarized labor market in them, and you get a lot of international migrants who occupy the, the non-offshorable uh, jobs that tend to be labor-intensive, in labor-intensive service-oriented sectors, so you get wage polarization between the, the talented people who are going into the, into the tradable core industries, and then the local service sector is occupied by international migrants. But you also get wage stratification, um, you get, so you get an upper tail, of course, that has to do with that, talent, that, that, that talented migration. But you also get an individualization of wages through the higher risk, uh, sort of the higher risk um, profile of the entrepreneurial class. Right? There's a lot, just a lot of winning and losing going on, and so this is leading to uh, a kind of a, a stretching out of the income ladder in the big cities. It all combines, in my view, to lead to these higher Gini coefficients, but not to the frustration that you get in other places. Because urban, urban labor markets, both at the upper and the lower tail, they're opportunity machines, right? We might not like observe, you know, on kind of observable snapshot level, we, we're disturbed by inequality, we're disturbed by gentrification, but by and large, these places are with a lot of churn and a lot of mobility. What's going on in the other places is simply that employment is not increasing or it's decreasing, uh, labor force Force participation is declining in these other places, and opportunity is drying up. So I think we need a dynamic view of it and not a static snapshot, and that's where dealing with indices of inequality are not any more enough to give us insight into the social and economic reality of places. That's kind of my major point, is that people want to use Gini coefficients and say, you know, New York is terrible. It has a Gini coefficient coefficient of, you know, 0.53, uh, and, you know, Provo, Utah, it's great, it has a Gini coefficient of 0.38, that's actually true, everybody, except that people are angrier in Provo, Utah than they are in Manhattan, right? And, there's, and that's probably because the Gini coefficient isn't capturing the reality in a full way. Uh, so I think all that kind of stuff is going on. And then last point about authoritarianism. You obviously, you know, um, there's a, a lot of debate we could have in a kind of philosophical, broader philosophical way about what is authoritarian, what is not, what is freedom. Um, I actually wasn't going there. What I wanted to do was make a very simple point. Uh, just take a very simple definition of to what extent are we, uh, are people expressing preferences for leaders who will either respect procedural rules or not. You can like or not like the rules, but there's a big division that's opening up today between, uh, between a politic of expressed political preferences for, I want a leader to come in and I'm sick of all of these procedures and rules because this isn't doing anything for me. That's what I'm calling the new authoritarianism. 
I'm not talking about the kind of broader philosophical question that you were raising. And I think that, though, is, is a really important issue because for the last for the last half century, the world, what we saw is that there was a slowly rising arc of the spread of formal democracy around the world and that that curve has now inverted. That we are seeing very rapidly in the last few years that a number of countries have gone back to what we might call systems that are less that model of, of, of formal democracy. And now we're seeing it in the core Western countries that you have strong movements for leaders who have a kind of a questionable relationship to that notion of formal democracy. That's really the question I wanted to talk about. Thanks, Mike. I think you another round of questions, if you still have a little bit of time, right? Okay. All right, I have to pick one. Pick, okay. Here, please. Hello, uh, I'm Irina Gomes. I'm architect and uh, an environmental activist. Uh, I would like uh, to thank you for your presentation and just to make two really quick questions. Uh, your last slide uh, uh, had a phrase that was, we need to rethink, uh, or a rethink is urgently required. And I would like to think, to, to ask if this rethink doesn't happen, what do you think is the worst scenario? Uh, the other question is, uh, um, how do you include climate change uh, in your analysis? Uh, this year the Anthropocene uh, era was recognized, so this is real. I would like to, to, to ask you how do you think, what do you think about this? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for a very stimulating uh, presentation about an issue that I think we are all struggling with. My question, uh, I think, speaks directly to this last point you raised about the change in democracy and what it means. And um, I was wondering whether you also looked, or you think it's important to look, about, uh, to those that have not participated in this voting. So it's not so much, uh, it's not only about the direction of vote, but also about those that are uh, becoming out of this democratic system that we have now, and whether that would change the results. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Here at the front, first row. Thank you. Uh, I'm Alexander. I'm an associate uh, researcher here at uh, EGOT CEG. Thanks a lot for your brilliant and very stimulating lecture. Um, what I would like to ask is, um, you, you've brought us a very compelling picture of um, the latest uh, political developments like Brexit and the Trump election as a, as, as, as a political expression of a clash of two worlds which have a uh, multi-factor but very specific set of characteristics and which have a geographical expression. Which, when, when you then also take into account what the demographic trends are for those uh, for those for that for those geographical spaces this could lend some credence to the idea that uh, Basically, while Trump has won and while Brexit has won, this is kind of like the last stand of the angry white reactionaries which are doomed to, to lose this battle. So my question is, do you think that that is the case? Or do these countervailing tendencies, like these barriers to movement, could they create a blockage such that we're in for the long run in terms of a clash, a, polit a clash of these, between these two worlds with these political expressions? Thanks. Okay, I think I might add one very short, if you don't mind, Michael. Uh, in some some places, or in, in a certain sense, with this idea of the retraction of globalization and the resurgence of nationalisms, what do you think is going to? How do you think is going to evolve the field of regional development? In the sense that, uh, to what extent now, uh, countries and governments are paying will pay more attention to their own. Uh, internal structures and promote regional development because so far re 
regional development policies have not really delivered expected growth, right? So we think, we think this field is going to, to become more vivid somehow. What's your views on this? And thanks. Okay. Um, well, worst scenario uh, question. Um, I am no more. Uh, I have no more ability to see the future than anyone. Um, what we know is that um, in a complex world, the unexpected is uh, all, you know is, 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 is occurs much more often than we believe, because I think we have we have of course ways of framing reality, which tend to be conservative. I'm conservative not in the political sense, but in the sense that we have uh, whether we are scholars or just a non-scholar, you know, we have a very strong framing effect. And I think that is what uh, most preoccupies me, is um, that um, a lot of people act like, you know, very surprised that all this is happening. They go, oh my God, how could this happen? It's a black swan. It came out of nowhere. Uh, many of us, I think, uh, here I'm going to, you know, do a little uh, bragging is, I mean, I've been on the side of economic geography where we have been saying for a long time that I'm actually not anti-cities. I'm not part of that lobby that thinks that big cities are bad or that we should, you know, uh, privilege the countryside or anything like that. In fact, I think it's necessary. But you could clearly see for a long time that lots of territories that it wasn't going well and that migration and job retraining were not solving people's problems. I've been having this argument in colloquia with geographers and economists for 15 years now. And the, the mental framing that goes on was, oh, but we know because our theory told us that all we have to do is even, is all we have to do is construct more housing and then all, every, anyone wants to get into a big city, if we would just construct more housing, that p there would be less barriers to entry to big cities. And moreover, um, we just have to kind of wait because you know anyone who loses their job, of course they're gonna have an incentive to either retrain or do something. It was kind of like all these mechanisms would solve the problem. But you know, models, whether it is in geography or economics, they don't like things like traps, right? They're very uncomfortable. Uh, those are not the kinds of equilibria that we like. So the worst case, coming back to your point, what is the worst case scenario? We don't know. But what we should do is do everything we can to avoid it. That is, of course, m true for climate change. I'm not a climate change expert, but I have lots of friends who are. And um, climate change is going to be a huge shock to society, to nature, but also to economic geography. And it's coming, it's, it's out there, but it's gonna produce a financial, I mean, we already know, for example, that um, housing markets in coastal regions of America are going to collapse, right? And there will be some kind of meltdown of the financial system when the markets really are convinced that it's over. Sometime in the next, say, 10 to 15 years, all that real estate in places like, like Florida, it goes like that. And then the, who's going to pay for the debt? We don't even know if we have the resources anymore. And then what happens? So again, worst case scenarios are almost unimaginable. They're so complex. But that's why we need to take these issues, I think, quite seriously now. Um, someone made a, made a point about non-participants. Um, yes, but this is like an endogenous part of Western democracy now, is non-voting people. So why don't people vote? They must figure it's not worth it. They either figure that it won't affect them very much or that they can't change anything. Now, that in and of itself is a really interesting part of the system. And I think it's a major question. Uh, obviously, you take the, the case of the United States, the Republicans integrate it actually as a, as a part of strategy. And that links to the, the last stand of the white people question, right? I'm actually ab astonished, I mean, in, I'm very impressed by their skill because they understand that demography goes against them, but they figured out that they could use institutions to forestall the effects of democracy by essentially, first of all, by doing what's called gerrymandering in America, concentrating the vote in rural places or conservative places, and by discouraging the people 
certain people from voting. How long that will last or what the contours of it will be is very interesting. It's an open question. Uh, and then finally, I think to Mario's question, um, that was kind of my conclusion is we really need a rethink. Uh, I think a rethink of a regional or territory or the territorial aspects of economic development because um, even we, we have huge policy apparatuses that actually are devoted to this. There's the cohesion funds, the structural funds, and in most countries, vast policy bureaucracies that are devoted to uh, local and regional economic development with billions and billions of dollars and innumerable policy attention hours devoted to them. The problem is really um, not so much though, as I said earlier, I don't think it's as simple as there is a world where everything is failing and it's the neoliberal Anglo-Saxon world. And then there's this other world where we're succeeding called you know, regulated social, social market, social democratic continental European. Because it doesn't work there either. So that's, I think, the more serious challenge is that the actual models and tools that we use, even where we use them, they are in, in, in my, I mean, we have a lot of research on this that we do in my department at LSE, and we are seeing that the predicted effects of these policies aren't there. They're not stopping these effects from emerging. So that's what I meant by a rethink. A rethink is not just saying we're going to get interested in this. We are already interested in it. It's that maybe our theory models, they need some adjustment, or we, we need some new hypotheses and some new evidence. Okay, thanks. Great, great talk. Thanks, you. thanks very much to Michael. Uh, please, uh, thank you for coming, and join me on a round of applause, and thank again, Michael. Great talk, Michael. Okay, thanks. That's okay. Very good, excellent. Yeah, it was a yeah, subject it was great that, uh, discussion. Okay. Because uh, you really need Michael, hi, I'm my next friend Garnet. I'm at London Knowledge Labs, part of UCL. Oh, okay.